Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Pediatric Grand Rounds today. Thank you for joining us. Our speaker today is Dr. Emily Doherty, Section Chief of Genetics and Associate Professor of Pediatrics at VTC SOM. Uh, Dr. Doherty uh, received her training at UVA SOM, completed her residency at Children's National Medical Center and a genetics fellowship at NIH. She's been with the Carillion family since 2006. And in addition to her clinical responsibilities, she until recently served as the Associate Program Director of the Pediatric Residency Program. She is ex was extensively involved in all things educational and lends her time as well to VTC SOM, where she serves as a genetics tract uh, developer. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Doherty. Thank you. Uh, today, we're going to talk about newborn screening. I want to begin by saying that I don't have any financial disclosures. The objectives of our talk today, we're going to review the inborn errors of metabolism included in the Virginia newborn screen. We're going to talk about indications for ordering genetics consultation in infants with an abnormal newborn screen. We're going to plan follow-up testing of an infant with an abnormal newborn screen for an inborn error of metabolism. So let's talk about why the newborn screen is important and how it was developed. I think that this classic slide almost says it all. This is a family that both of the children have phenylketonuria, PKU, and the boy on the left was not treated at birth because he was not diagnosed, but his sister was tested for the condition at birth found to have it and started on dietary treatment. And you can see that the boy is neurologically impaired, but his sister is able to uh, sit and smile for the camera. She had a much better cognitive outcome. The PKU newborn test was developed by Dr. Guthrie, and this um, type of testing began in the 1960s. So there's a vintage slide that I'm showing you over on the left-hand side. Uh, the, uh, a needle is used to collect blood from the newborn's heel in, in uh, figure A. In figure B, the blood is spotted onto a piece of filter paper or a card and allowed to dry for a couple of hours, and then it's shipped to the lab. Each blood spot can be subdivided into multiple small pieces of filter paper so that multiple tests can be used on each blood spot. Slide D shows that uh, this is a, a agarose gel with deficient medium. It doesn't have enough phenylalanine in it. And on the left side of the picture are blood spots that have um, blood from infants with high phenylalanine levels. And on the right side are normal um, infant blood samples. So the phenylalanine fuses out of the piece of filter paper into the agarose gel. And when this happens, uh, the bacteria can then grow because now they have a normal amount of amino acid, uh, the phenylalanine present. And so this produces a ring of bacterial growth around the uh, piece of filter paper that came from the newborn with high blood phenylalanine concentrations. By comparison, on the right side of that picture, the newborns that had a normal amount of phenylalanine in their blood that wasn't enough to bacterial growth and there's um, no ring. So the Guthrie test set the standard for newborn screening. It is uh, inexpensive, easy to interpret, and uh, the results will help us to manage what would otherwise be a devastating neurologic disease. So in preparing my talk, I reviewed a recent um, article on inborn errors of material written by Dr. Kanungo and colleagues. So this data was, um, this article was published in uh, 2018. So uh, this is what they had to say about the numbers of newborn screening in the United States. So every year there are close to 4 million infant births in the United States and almost everyone is screened by the, the newborn screening program. In the U.S., newborn screening is mandatory uh, with an option for opt-out, typically for religious reasons. The article by Kanungo stated that approximately one out of every 320 newborns screened is diagnosed with one of the 29 core conditions that are on the panel. So um, uh, when you do the math, 
uh, this ends up being about 125,000 uh, babies that are diagnosed with a condition uh, by newborn screening in the US. And of that subset, um, uh, what's relevant to the talk today, about 10% of those babies, it's about 1,200 babies, are diagnosed with an inborn error of metabolism that's intellectually debilitating or fatal in the newborn period. So the current thought is that the uh, cumulative incidence of inborn errors of metabolism detected by newborn screening is about one in 3,000. Now we're going to talk about the mandated testing. So the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act was passed by Congress in the year 2008. This act established national standards for screening and facilitated testing in some states that needed additional assistance. This act was renewed in the year 2014. The image that I'm showing you on the left side of the slide is a campaign image from the March of Dimes, and this is requesting grassroots support for the Newborn Screening Reauthorization Act of 2019. So the image says, act now, newborn screening saves lives, with the implication that they would, they would like the reader to support the Newborn Screening Reauthorization Act. So currently, this act has only passed the House of Representatives. Uh, this act was intended to allocate money to demonstrate efficacy of current screening practices, improve lab quality, and assist some states to expand the number of disorders that they are testing for. All right, a Roanoke Memorial Hospital patient um, actually inspired new Virginia legislation a couple years ago. So the RETS bill, HB 1362, was passed by the Virginia G General Assembly in the year 2018. It was sponsored by Delegate Terry Austin after he learned that a baby boy in his district died after being diagnosed with a condition called MCAD. And I'll talk about that condition um, a little bit later, but the baby uh, was diagnosed too late. Some of you who are listening today probably assisted in the care of that baby. Because the baby was born on a Saturday at Rona Memorial Hospital, at the time the newborn screening labs were not open over the weekend and this resulted in a delayed release of test results, and the baby died from a metabolic crisis early on Thursday morning. This was because of delayed notification of the provider and the family. So the bill mandates that the state lab remain open seven days a week to test for a time-critical disorder. Uh, this was um, assisted by support from the family, and although I'm sorry for their loss, I'm glad that they were able to um, bring some positive change as a, as a consequence of their experience. So let's talk about what's on the newborn screen and how did it get there. Uh, it was established because of a, um, recommended, a recommended uniform screening panel, or RUSP, um, and so this was published in the year 2005. The RUSP is a standard list of disorders that the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services recommends for states to screen as a part of their state universal newborn screening programs. Uh, disorders on the RUSP were chosen because of evidence supporting the potential net benefit of screening, as well as the feasibility of screening and the availability of effective treatments. And uh, it's currently recommended that all newborns born in the U.S. are screened for all disorders on the RUSP. So most states screen for a uh, majority of disorders on the RUSP, and newer conditions are still in the process of adoption. Some states also screen for additional disorders, and we'll be talking about uh, some state experiences uh, coming up here. So uh, regarding choosing individual diseases uh, to be on the recommended uniform screening panel, uh, some of the, the um, considerations were whether there was um, scientific evidence um, about the utility of a screening test, whether there was an effective treatment available, an adequate understanding of the natural history of the disorder, that this was a condition that was worth treating. Uh, it turns out in metabolic genetics that some people have biochemical abnormalities, but that these don't actually seem to cause um, significant problems. And so those conditions um, shouldn't necessarily be treated for. Um, 
uh, I'll talk about uh, the core conditions and the secondary conditions. This is uh, about whether the condition is part of uh, a differential diagnosis of another condition and whether the screening test is really related to a treatable, clinically significant condition that we would want to do something about. So commentary from a public health focused article by Chan and Petros um, referenced below um, commented that this working group was all uh, cons consisting of experts in metabolic genetics. And at the time, it didn't include experts in evidence based medicine, bioethics, primary care or health economics. So here's a screenshot. Uh, the expert group came up with a. Um, a scoring system to um, determine the overall feasibility and utility of screening for specific disorders. So I, I'm aware that it's a little hard to read all of the names of the disorders at the bottom of the slide, and I do want to uh, point out some selected disorders. So uh, to orient uh, listeners to the graph at the bottom of the slide, uh, there are a number of um, genetic conditions that are present on the on the newborn screen or considered for newborn screening um, all all listed out uh, with the more um, severe conditions that obtained a higher score suggesting that they should be screened disorders on the left and uh, less feasible feasible or reasonable disorders on the right and the numeric score is listed there so uh, i'd like to point the listeners attention down at the bottom of the slide um, uh, right over to the far left is MCAD, uh, which is a disorder of fatty acid oxidation. That disorder received the, the highest score. In the middle of the slide, I think that listeners cannot see my cursor, uh, but for example, in the middle of the slide, um, one of the conditions that uh, had a moderate amount of um, recommendation was cobalamin C and D uh, deficiency causing methylmalonic acidemia. And I'll talk about that later. And then at the far right of the slide at the bottom includes some uh, lysosomal storage disorders, including Pompeii and Crabbe disease. Uh, bear in mind that this slide was uh, published um, in, in uh, 2006. Okay, so uh, now I've listed out all of the 29 disorders that are on the recommended um, mutiform screening panel. Uh, and so when I uh, sat down to organize this slide, I wanted to dis display the conditions in a way that would be meaningful when I came back and talked uh, to you about what data we have from the state of Virginia. So to orient you to the slide, the uh, conditions, the kind of disorder uh, it is, is listed in the column. And then the single disorders are uh, listed underneath that. And the uh, ones that I'm going to talk about that where we actually had cases diagnosed in Virginia recently are towards the top and the ones that have not uh, recently had a diagnosis in Virginia are towards the bottom and I'll give you those exact numbers a little later in the talk. So over on the uh, the far um, left hand column uh, is the list of uh, primary organic acidemias and these include isovaleric acidemia, gluteric acidemia type 1, propionic acidemia, 3 methyl proteinyl CoA carboxylase deficiency uh, and others. The second category, the second column over is the list of fatty acid oxidation disorders, which includes MCAD. Uh, to talk about uh, this particular condition for those listeners who are not familiar, um, MCAD is medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, and this is a disorder of medium chain fatty acid oxidation. Uh, as opposed to in burners of protein metabolism, where there's a problem breaking down uh, proteins because of buildup of abnormal amino acids. Uh, disorders of fatty acid oxidation have to do with burning fat for energy. Um, so uh, other disorders uh, in this category um, that are screened for include uh, VL, very long chain um, fatty acid oxidation deficiency, LCHAD, and others. In the middle column, amino acidopathies that are screened for include PKU, mipocerpurin disease, arginosexinic acidemia and citrullinemia, which are urea cycle defects and, and others. 
uh, hemoglobinopathies are screened for on the newborn screen. And then other disorders that are included in the core panel are biotinidase and partial biotinidase deficiencies. Biotin is uh, vitamin B7, and biotinidase deficiency is a, is a genetic deficiency of the enzyme that recycles biotin. And so untreated biotinidase deficiency results in seizures, deafness, and blindness, and it's treatable with uh, vitamin B7. You can buy biotin over the counter and it will treat this disorder beautifully. There are several forms of galactosemia that are screened for on the newborn screen. Um, GALT galactosemia uh, being the major uh, one that, that we think about and take care of at this time. Uh, hearing and um, is, is also considered to be um, a core component of the newborn screening panel. Uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, which is not the focus of my talk today, but I could discuss additional um, questions maybe at the end of the talk if time permits. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia and hypothyroidism. All right. The secondary targets of the um, recommended uniform screening panel, these are conditions that can be diagnosed when uh, in the process of trying to diagnose a core condition. And so these would be uh, considered um, conditions that might, uh, for example, not be as severe. So typically these disorders are going to be found consequent to confirmatory testing for an out of range result for a core condition. So under organic acidemias, remember I said uh, before that there was um, kind of medium score for methylmalonic acidemia due to cobalamin C and D deficiency. There it is at the top of that slide um, on, the, on the left, malonic acidemia and other organic acidemias. In the middle uh, column, other fatty acid oxidation disorders, including um, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 2 and glutaric aciduria type 2. Amino acidopathies, including um, hyperphenylalanemia, which is high phenylalanine levels in the absence of PKU, um, hypermethionemia, and, and other amino acidopathies. Other hemoglobin variants um, are secondary targets of the newborn screen, and other types of galactosemia are also uh, secondary targets of the, of the, uh, of the newborn screen. Right. So, uh, the Hunter's Hope Foundation was founded by Buffalo Bills quarterback John Kelly, and the mission of the foundation is to support research on Crab A disease, which is a lysosomal storage disorder. Remember that that was over to the far right um, in terms of scoring when we uh, talked about the components of the of the RUSP. Um, however, that was um, that slide was published in 2006 um, before uh, it was realized that a bone marrow transplant uh, could ameliorate uh, the, the, um, the signs of uh, Crab A disease. So this screenshot um, quotes a plea for advocacy from Hunter's grandmother. She says, did you know that a simple heel prick through a newborn screening test could have saved my grandson Hunter's life? Well, it's true. For diseases like Crab A, early detection through newborn screening is crucial for affected children to receive potentially life-saving treatment which is only effective if administered before a child is symptomatic. Help ensure that the children in your state are screened at birth for Crab A and similar diseases by taking action. Thank you. And then farther down on the website, which I edited to fit this slide, uh, there's a rec uh, recommendation that all readers take action and advocate for expanded newborn screening in, in your state. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the Hunter's Hope Foundation and this family lobbied to have Crab A disease added to the New York State uh, newborn screen. And so there was a recent publication from Wasserstein and colleagues that talked about uh, what happened after this was done. So between the years 2006 and 2014, almost 2 million infants, uh, New, New York State babies, were screened for Crab A disease. And this resulted in five infants who were diagnosed with early infantile Crab A disease. Three of them died two of them from stem cell related transplant complications and one from untreated disease. Two children who received the stem cell transplant have moderate to severe developmental delays. Also, screening identified 46 children who probably have late onset Crab A disease. Um, and so the implication here being that uh, these children were not going to die in the newborn period and probably didn't have to have uh, screening in the newborn period in order to have their disease diagnosed. So the article says, before screening, the incidence of Crab A disease was estimated at 
one in 100,000, but the actual incidence of early infantile crab A disease in New York detected by newborn screening is only one in 394,000. Based on the best of, uh, evidence prior to screening, we anticipated that 90% of infants would have early infantile crab A disease and 10% would have later onset forms. However, it appears that these percentages may be reversed. Importantly, these numbers suggest that we are screening infants for predominantly later onset disease. And I think this sentence speaks for itself. This challenges traditional newborn screening criteria, which generally recommend that newborns be screened for treatable childhood onset disorders. So I really appreciate uh, this publication. New York State continues to screen for Crab A disease, but the data shows that we are identifying fewer patients with Crab A disease than we expected. And uh, we are predominantly identifying patients that uh, don't need to be treated in the newborn period. Uh, so I think this, um, uh, this says a lot about uh, needing to use caution as we expand uh, the disorders that are um, mandated for screening on, uh, in the U.S. So we're going to talk a little bit about ethics. When we talk about uh, the ethics of newborn screening, this has mainly revolved around the basic tenets of Wilson and Younger. Um, they published 19, in 1968 criteria for different types of disease screening. Um, uh, the article from Canungo um, says, although uh, one could argue that the fundamental ethical principles of non-maleficence and justice are not debatable in newborn screening, there are some other tenets of Wilson and Younger that could be discussed further. Beneficence as a tenant includes the intent of doing good by the patient, and I'll talk about that in another slide. Respect for autonomy um, it, uh, is another uh, discussion that we could have. And then uh, this, the Canungo and our article comments that the issues of resource allocation, availability of data, data and evidence, individual and parental rights and advances in technology are other areas that um, could feasibly be debated in newborn screening. Okay, um, there was a question about just for later, what are variant hemoglobins? So these are other hemoglobinopathies that are found on the newborn screen. Okay. Let's talk about beneficence. This is the idea of doing good by the patient. Uh, we have the intention of curing newborn or ameliorating newborn disease uh, by uh, identifying babies early so that we can start treatment early. Uh, but one of the drawbacks of newborn screening is that we identify a lot of babies that are false positives or carriers for the condition and they didn't actually need to be treated. Uh, this, um, uh, this issue means that we uh, actually provoke a lot of anxiety in families of children who had uh, an, a false positive newborn screen, and arguably that is not beneficial to the patient. The Canungo article says the anxiety costs associated with diagnostic confirmation odyssey with false positive and inconclusive screens or extent of treatment and procedures for clinically asymptomatic infants and carriers can create a vulnerable child or establishment of a pre existing condition for medical insurance. And this could be contrary to the underlying intent of beneficence. Beneficence is also debated when newborns are identified, when a newborn is identified with an inborn error of metabolism and requires metabolic nutrition um, to prevent associated long term morbidity and mortality. Um, one of the problems is uh, trying to prescribe a very expensive metabolic formula. Uh, for a baby and perhaps the, uh, the family doesn't have the means to acquire the formula. Another area of beneficence, I think this is an interesting um, uh, thought uh, relatable to our uh, current practice system in the US. Uh, there are very few board certified biochemical geneticists and uh, they are responsible for helping to care for the infants um, who are diagnosed by newborn screening. And um, because of the, sh the national shortage of specialists, this places an undue burden on the primary care doctor who often feels inept as an intermediary for newborn screening follow-up as routine practice. I thought that was a, a, a nice phrasing there of the concerns on the part of the, of the PCP. It can be very difficult uh, to interact with worried families um, who are concerned about their baby's abnormal newborn screen. And in some cases, they're uh, not worried for a valid medical reason because it's a false positive and that can be quite difficult. When we talk about the respect for autonomy, 
newborn screening is uh, mandatory with an optional religious opt out, but some hospitals don't have a clear discussion about this with the families uh, ahead of time. Respect for autonomy is most tested when a family gets a call from the primary care doctor birthing hospital to, um, uh, to come back um, and give another uh, sample uh, for recollection or that there's a positive screen. Often uh, families realize that the newborn screening test was done at that time. Um, uh, so uh, the idea is that we don't have enough staff to consent everyone for uh, newborn screening. And so instead we have people opt out, but uh, some families don't feel that they're adequately notified. Another um, item of discussion regarding respect for autonomy is the is what's done with the leftover newborn screening uh, blood spot cards. So in Virginia, the cards are uh, for normal babies are kept for six months and then they're destroyed and they're not allowed to be used for another use. The family can uh, send in a notarized request asking to have the blood spot screening card uh, returned to them and the, the state will do that under uh, certain circumstances. Uh, abnormal newborn screening cards are kept for 10 years, mostly with the thought that there may need uh, to be other confirmatory testing done on that sample or other, um, there may be other issues with that arise with the diagnosis. And so those cards are kept for 10 years. But other states in the US take the newborn screening cards and use them for research. And this is not something that uh, parents are, are consented for. Let's talk about some online resources. So let's say that uh, you, the primary care doctor, uh, are called because there's an abnormal uh, newborn screen for uh, maple syrup urine disease in your baby. Uh, what are you going to do next? Well, it's always important to read the recommendation that comes in on the abnormal newborn screen report. And I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about what resources I recommend. I recommend the website at, for the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, ACMGG, and you can find it at www.acmg.net. And here I'm showing you under practice resources here in orange, click on ACT or ACT sheets and algorithms. So uh, looking up uh, this, the uh, particular condition of uh, possible maple syrup urine disease, uh, here we are under uh, uh, the um, amino acidopathies. And then we are going to go down the column for the condition. All right, we see maple syrup urine disease and hydroxyprolinemia. The, the elevated analyte is leucine. And the ACMGG has both a PDF for an ACT sheet and an algorithm. And I'll show you those next. So this is the ACT sheet. Uh, this is some general information about the particular disorder. Uh, some of these disorders are, are very rare. And so the purpose of the sheet is to remind you, the primary care doctor who might not have thought about this since medical school or residency, uh, what kind of disorder uh, we are looking at and what are the general considerations for, for treatment. Uh, towards the bottom of the page, uh, under clinical considerations, it says maple syrup urine disease presents in neonates with feeding intolerance, failure to thrive, vomiting, lethargy, and maple syrup urine odor. If untreated, it will pr progress to irreversible mental retardation hyperactivity, failure to thrive, seizures, coma, cerebral edema, and possibly death. Hydroxyprolinemia is probably benign. This um, algorithm uh, shows how we work, how we should be working through an abnormal newborn screen. Uh, primary care providers and others should rest assured that uh, if the baby probably actually has the condition that you have the availability of a metabolic geneticist um, uh, here at Carillion. We're within the catchment area for UVA that has the contract with the state to cover the western side of Virginia. So at the top of the slide, we see um, the baby had elevated leucine, and now we're going to do some follow-up testing to try to um, confirm whether this baby might have maple syrup urine disease. Um, providers uh, will be instructed to collect urine ketones and also to send uh, plasma amino acids and urine organic acids for study. Uh, moving down to the next level of the tree, on the left-hand side, increased branch chain amino acids and metabolites would confirm a diagnosis of maple syrup urine disease. But if there's only increased hydroxyproline um, the, and the branch chain amino acids are normal, then this is um, a benign hydroxyprolinemia uh, diagnosis. And if the follow-up studies are all normal, then 
the newborn screen was a false positive and no further action is necessary. So uh, when I drafted this talk in February, I got some, uh, some data from the uh, Virginia newborn screening program and put it into the slides. And I recontacted the, uh, the team uh, two weeks ago and said, do you happen to have new data? And they said, yes, we do. So I quickly updated my slides with all of this data. Hopefully I remembered to keep the dates consistent. So if I made a cut and paste error, I'll point that out as we go along. So uh, for me, this is the equivalent of hot off the presses data about, um, about what was, what's been diagnosed recently in Virginia. So this flow chart was provided by the newborn state screening program and we begin at the upper top left. So of, of Virginia residents, about 134,000 infants were screened. Uh, ultimately 147,000 samples were received by the state lab. Now, actually uh, a number of the samples that come into the state lab um, are um, non-newborn samples from patients that live in Virginia with PKU, and the state has a no-fee monitoring program, uh, and so these are done on the, on the blood spot cards. Also, of the 147,000 samples that came in, about 1.5% of them were of unsatisfactory quality, so they're typically errors in collection technique. This resulted in 4 million tests run on, uh, on these babies, and of those, um, 17,000 uh, tests resulted abnormal, and 2,000 of those were critical. So. Um, all states have a tiered uh, approach to testing, so critical samples are much more likely to be a true diagnosis because the primary analyte is elevated above a, a um, threshold, a critical level, and there may be some supporting abnormalities. Uh, but um, uh, other, dis uh, other um, uh, diagnoses um, might be considered for mildly abnormal um, results. Okay. And so this led to uh, 4,600 uh, babies that were diagnosed with a particular condition, but almost uh, 4,000 of these were actually patients who were carriers for hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell or thalassemia. So that this um, was a uh, so it, that reduced the numbers of uh, of other diagnoses substantially, and about 250 babies were lost to follow up. So this data uh, goes from the beginning of 2019 to the end of May 2020. All right, so now I'm going to show you in the same table um, what uh, cases were diagnosed in Virginia between the start of 2019 and the, and the end of May 2020. Of organic acidurias, uh, two babies in Virginia were diagnosed with isovaleric acidemia. One baby was diagnosed with glutaric acidemia type 1. Three babies were diagnosed with propionic acidemia. One baby was diagnosed with 3-methylcroteal CoA carboxylase deficiency. Of babies in Virginia diagnosed with fatty acid oxidation disorders, 12 were diagnosed with MCAD, 4 with VLCAD, and 1 with LCAD. For amino acidopathies, four babies were diagnosed with PKU. Three babies were diagnosed with maple syrup urine disease. Two babies were diagnosed with arginine-O6-cynic acidemia, and two babies were diagnosed with citrullinemia. In the other category, two babies were diagnosed with biotinidase deficiency, 10 babies were diagnosed with partial biotinidase deficiency, and six babies were diagnosed with gold galactosemia. On the secondary panel, uh, two babies were diagnosed with carnitine palmitoyl transferase type 2. Three babies were diagnosed with hyperphenylalanemia, and two babies were diagnosed with hypermethylalanemia. So uh, the Virginia newborn screen clearly identifies some babies uh, that are carriers for specific disorders. And this is not useful information for management of the baby in the newborn period. Um, the uh, diagnosing carriers is not the intention of the newborn screen. Um, as a geneticist, my perspective now is that this additional information um, can be valuable in the care of the family. Many inborn errors of metabolism are autosomal recessive. So if a baby is found to be a carrier, this means that um, uh, at least one parent is also a genetic carrier. And therefore, uh, we might be able to do carrier testing on both parents and figure out whether the second parent is a carrier and just didn't happen to pass that mutation 
to that baby, but might pass the mutation to a subsequent pregnancy. Um, and although I didn't talk about carrier data for the previous disorders, um, I am going to talk about some new and to be added uh, disorders in Virginia. And um, I thought it would be interesting to talk about the uh, about the carrier status that was found in infants um, with these disorders because it has implications for how many adult Virginians um, are uh, are living here that are carriers and uh, that we might have more cases diagnosed in the future. So, Hunter syndrome. Um, excuse me, Hurler syndrome, MPS1, uh, was recently added in Virginia. This is a lysosomal storage disorder that causes macrocephaly, hepatosplenomegaly, and coarse facial features. Some of these babies have subtle facial features uh, present at birth, and, um, and so they're not always immediately recognizable because of their dysmorphisms. Over time, affected individuals accumulate um, the um, MPS um, all over systemically, including their airway and their heart. And so airway compromise and cardiac failure are frequent causes of death. If done before age two years, the data for Perler syndrome is that hematopoietic stem cell transplant can ameliorate the severity. So Virginia reported uh, four MPS type one cases diagnosed since the beginning of the year 2019 and 29 carriers for MPS one. However, pseudodeficiency alleles complicate newborn screening for this disorder. I personally have received many, many calls uh, from uh, primary care providers in the region about uh, their baby uh, having their patient having an abnormal newborn screen for uh, MPS1. And so uh, one of the important components of screening for MPS1 in Virginia is that when the baby's enzyme level is low, the state will automatically reflex to DNA sequencing. And once the test results are back, it's possible to compare the mutations that are found with the baby to the list of known pseudodeficiency alleles. This helps us to figure out which patients are actually have the condition and which patients just have a pseudodeficiency. But this has definitely been a problem and, and very frustrating uh, for everyone involved. Pompeii disease is another lysosomal storage disorder. Uh, I'm showing you an affected infant who's on a respirator over on the left. Um, this is, these babies have hypotonia, neuropathic bulbar weakness, respiratory failure, hepatomegaly, and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's now possible to treat Pompeii disease with recombinant enzyme therapy. At the bottom of the slide, I'm showing you a pre and a post treatment of chest x-ray showing that recombinant enzyme therapy uh, ameliorated the cardiomyopathy of Pompeii disease in an affected patient. Of the data that's come in since the beginning of 2019 in Virginia, we have not had any babies diagnosed with classic Pompeii disease. However, there were two probable late onset and five possible late onset Pompeii cases that were diagnosed and 25 carriers of Pompeii disease that were identified by newborn screening. So what's coming up next? Well, X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy, XALD, is going to be added in, in Virginia. So uh, the slide shows an affected boy. Um, this is an X-linked disorder. And uh, when uh, boys are born, they're neurologically normal. But over time, uh, this is a proxosomal disorder, and they have neurodegeneration. So there's usually worsening uh, ADHD. Um, the uh, MRI becomes abnormal. So these patients experience be abnormal behaviors with a progression to dementia, loss of vision and hearing, uh, progression to uh, spasticity and quadriparesis and adrenal insufficiency. The classic MRI pattern shows, shown here is a symmetric enhanced T2 signal in the parieto occipital region. And X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy can be ameliorated with uh, stem cell transplant. Also, uh, screening for spinal muscular atrophy is, uh, or SMA, is going to be added in Virginia. This is an autosomal recessive neurodegenerative disorder. These patients have progressive weakness and respiratory failure from loss of anterior horn cells in the spinal cord. Uh, interestingly, SMA patients have um, normal cognitive abilities. Uh, so the, the slides here are showing you two very floppy but alert babies with SMA who are not able to move their arms and legs against gravity. Gravity. So now there are two FDA approved treatments 
for SMA that could be started early when a baby is diagnosed with SMA through newborn screening. Nesinersen is an injectable antisense oligonucleotide that will ameliorate the condition, and also gene therapy just became available, uh, which is very exciting. There's a, the uh, center at um, EVMS and also UVA offer a gene therapy for SMA. So now I'm going to review some common calls I get uh, regarding the newborn screen. Uh, bear in mind that I am not the metabolic specialist, and so I don't get calls directly from the state. These are some common questions that I get from providers in our region um, who would like to ask me to help them with their babies that have an abnormal newborn screen. So I get a lot of calls about failed newborn screen for GALT, galactosemia. And I want to review with you the state lab numbers from 2019 through May 2020. Uh, uh, six children were diagnosed with classical GALT. Eight, nine children were diagnosed as being just carriers for GALT, so they only had one GALT deficiency allele. Six children had Duarte. Uh, Duarte is a, um, a, a somewhat underactive um, allele, but still, there's still some normal function, and it's debatable whether patients with uh, Duarte galactosemia should have any treatment at all. Um, a different variant, uh, Duarte galactosemia, Duarte combined with a classic galactosemia mutation, 26 babies were found in the U.S., and other variants, um, uh, 14 um, babies were found. So this means that uh, the newborn state screen in Virginia uh, identifies a lot of uh, what would be considered false positives for galactosemia. So when you are notified by the state lab that your baby uh, might have galactosemia, please keep in mind your ba the, the baby is probably, by statistics, a carrier or has Duarte variant galactosemia, for which it's controversial to treat. Uh, it's possible that uh, if uh, mom is breastfeeding the baby, that um, we could potentially uh, recommence breastfeeding once the um, final follow-up from the newborn screening has been done. I recommend you tell the mom, any breastfeeding moms, to pump and freeze her breast milk because otherwise the milk will dry up in the, during the somewhat long process that it takes to con confirm or rule out this diagnosis and she'll lose her milk supply if she waits that long. Uh, specifically for managing these infants, I recommend that you try to order a galactosemia with reflex test immediately. Uh, so this type of test um, is designed to uh, check the GALT enzyme activity, and patients that have low levels will automatically be reflexed to checking for common mutations. So uh, if you've got a baby with an abnormal screen for galactosemia, uh, please call me and I'll walk you through how to order that test at Carillion. For babies that are currently on a lactose-containing formula, also try to get a galactose-1 phosphate level drawn um, before changing them to a non-lactose-containing uh, formula. Now we're going to talk about uh, failed newborn screens for MCAD. Uh, because of tiered reporting, uh, the babies that had only a somewhat worrisome uh, test result for MCAD, you'll get a fax from the state lab that a newborn screen needs to be recollected. Um, so it's uh, important to assess the baby uh, and then send in a, a new sample for analysis. But um, uh, if you get a call from the metabolic physician at UVA, then that's very concerning that your baby actually has this disorder. Um, uh, patients with MCAD deficiency cannot tolerate uh, prolonged fasting because they can't break down fats for energy. Therefore, treatment for MCAD is frequent feedings, supplementation with, or with oral carnitine. Uh, carnitine binds to the fatty acids and pull them into the mitochondria where it, um, they are burned for energy. And um, it, any babies that are not feeding appropriately need to be admitted for IV dextrose. I've also gotten calls about newborn screens that were positive for a number of disorders all at the same time in NICU graduates. So sometimes we'll get a baby that failed the screen for maple syrup urine disease, homocystinuria, and PKU. And it turns out that the baby was on TPN. So usually these abnormal screens are attributable to the, uh, TP, to the TPN. I showed you some data from Virginia that actually diagnosing these patients with these disorders is relatively uncommon until it, until, um, it happens. Um, it's important um, to do follow-up tests, though, to make sure that your baby uh, might not actually be affected with one of these disorders. We're going to keep repeating the newborn screening off of TPN until uh, all normal results are achieved. 
occasionally I'll get a call from the, uh, the ER, the ward or the PICU telling me that they've got a patient there with an unexplained metabolic acidosis. It might be sepsis, but it might not be sepsis. It may, and maybe it's an inborn error of metabolism, but the newborn screen hasn't resulted yet. So the state lab is now open seven days a week. So if it's possible, I recommend to try to call them because we could potentially get some data about a treatable newborn um, disorder on the, with the state screen. Although clearly the uh, the Virginia state screen doesn't treat doesn't um, diagnose all disorders. Uh, for babies that have unexplained metabolic acidosis. Think about whether the baby might have an organic aciduria and uh, determine what is the anion gap and check an ammonia level uh, because ammonia can be elevated in some organic acidurias. And then uh, please give me a call so we can uh, take care of your patient. I get a number of calls every year about babies who failed the newborn screen for cystic fibrosis. Prenatal CF carrier testing is be in, in adult women is becoming much more widespread. So a lot of women in our region have had carrier testing for cystic fibrosis that was offered to them early in the pregnancy, but some of them don't really remember or didn't really understand what they were consenting to. So if your baby fails the newborn screen for cystic fibrosis, talk to the mother of the baby and figure out whether she had prenatal CF carrier testing, because if she had testing and she was negative, then this reduces the likelihood that, that this baby actually has cystic fibrosis. Uh, when babies fail the newborn screen for cystic fibrosis in Virginia, um, the babies above a, a critical uh, trypsinogen level will have um, DNA testing done. So uh, rest assured, this is probably pending on your patient. And there's a cystic fibrosis center at UVA and those patients should be triaged there. Now we're going to do some review questions. So uh, please use the chat box to tell me what you think. All right. Uh, which of the following disorders were recently added to the Virginia State newborn screen? A, MCAD and OTC deficiency. B, X-linked ALD and SMA. C, MPS1 and Pompe disease. Or D, Crab A disease and hyperphenylalanemia. What do you think? Okay, so I'm seeing lots of Bs. Um, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy and SMA are planning to be added to the Virginia State newborn screen, but MPS1 and Pompe disease have been on the newborn screen for about the last year. All right, what website did I recommend for reviewing newborn screen follow-up algorithms? The ACMGG, which is the College of Medical Genetics, the ABMGG, which is the Board of Medical Genetics, the AAP website for pediatrics, the CDC website for national health, or ASHAG, which is the umbrella organization for genetics. Okay. Uh, so the correct answer is A, the ACMGG for the American College of Medical Genetics. All right, so Friday afternoon is only about 4% of the entire week, but it seems like at least 75% of my calls about uh, abnormal newborn screen results are generated on Friday afternoons. So let's say that it's 4.45 p.m. when you, the primary care physician, get a call from the state lab saying that your newborn patient had a critical abnormal screen for methylmalonic acidemia. It's 4.45 p.m. Your clinic is closing in 15 minutes for the weekend. What will you do next? A, you're going to write a WIC prescription for an, an oral formula that treats methylmalonic acidemia. B, you're going to call the family immediately to arrange for the baby to be seen in the emergency department this evening. C, you're going to see the baby Monday. Or D, you're going to place a referral order to genetics. Good. So all responders are appropriately saying that if you get a call from the state lab for a critical newborn screen, then those babies need to be worked up immediately. I've also seen prep questions along these lines. Uh, when in doubt, evaluate the child immediately and collect follow-up labs. Okay. Uh, so this concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I list my references here.